Hello and welcome everybody, I am One Proud Bavarian and today I present to you the first episode of what will eventually amount to be the strategy guide for this game on this channel. This game of course is Terminal Conflict. We are playing the United States of America as you can see by our color being blue in the interface and we are facing an opponent. Evil, evil communism. The USSR is our opponent that we are trying to contain in this strategic Cold War game. Now do not be afraid of this game, I will explain the menus in detail in this very first episode. We will do step-by-step -step explanations in what you need to consider, where you can find numbers, how you can learn more information and how you can try and learn to outsmart your opponent. For starters, let's just take a look at this very screen. In the top left you have 1946 to 1951, which are just the years that we are currently in. There are 10 total timelines, timelines being 5 years each. In each timeline you pick a theater that you want to focus on and your enemy does the same thing. The focus is centered around theaters. Now theaters, you can really easily see that the thick outlines limit where theater is. So for example this right here is the North American theater on which we could focus. Each theater is made up by several zones that you can see right here. North America being our home theater and being very much influenced and controlled by us of course. Keeping your home theatre under control is vital to win the game. Now if you want to leave a theatre screen, I will showcase that here with the Central American one, then just click on the map top right. If you have any UI element that you're not sure about, just hold the left click on top of it and in the bottom you will get a notification about what it does and what it is there for. You can do that with anything, really. Now let's move on to this right here. At the end of every timeline you gain victory points based on your performance overall on the world. So how much territory in theatres you control determines how much points you get. If you control 20% or more within one theatre you gain one victory point per theatre. At the moment we have five such regions. If you control more than 50% you get two victory points per theatre. And if you control more than 90% in a theatre then you get three victory points per theatre. Right now our home theatre is our strongest theatre and it is sitting, as you can see, right here in the bottom right, at 70%. That means to bring it up to the next level, 90%, we would have to invest quite an amount of resources because that is a jump of 20%. You have to consider that when gunning for victory. Now the victory conditions are quite clear. The first one means that you have to gain 100 victory points more than your opponent, so for example 117 to 17. You can do that mostly by achieving victory on the map, so control as much land as you can, but also by stuff like the space race and various events. So far, so good. Another victory that can be achieved is if you simply have more victory points than your opponent at the end of 1991. So after all is set and done, all 10 timelines are over, you can take a look at winning with the victory points that you have. That is not what you should gun for though. And last but not least, of course, there is the completion of the space race. If you complete the space race, you gain something called the Space Defense Initiative that renders the nuclear weapons of your opponent useless and essentially traps them in their little communist prison. Perfect. Now let's move on to talk about the defeat conditions. You don't want to have a domestic interests mismanagement, more on that in this episode, but also in detail in the next few episodes that are to come. And of course you can also lose just by closing the game. Up here we have the Doomsday Clock, which essentially tells you how hot the Cold War has become. Now to the right of it, once it is topped out, you can launch nukes and destroy the world. It might lead to victory, but more on that later. For the moment let's just confirm and enter the match and talk about what you have to do when you set up your match for the first time. What we have here are theatre focuses. Your opponent and you each pick one theatre focus per timeline. This is the very first timeline, 1946 to 1951. And essentially what you're picking is in which theatre in the world you want to be active in this timeline. Or maybe you just want to fake it and act as though you want to be active in it and mislead your opponent. More on those strategies later on. For the moment, if you click on the top here, you can switch from the theater to the focus view, which makes it so that the theater names disappear and it just shows you what sort of focus you can pick. There is a choice between disarmament and arms races. Not all focuses are created equal. Having a disarmament option in your home theater gives you way more focus points than a disarmament anywhere else. That is because disarming your home theater is quite the step. It can be viable to disarm your home theater, especially early on, but we will talk about this strategy later. For the moment I just believe that it is important to talk about the difference. Arms races give you more focus points, as you can see here, 4 against 2. That is because in disarmament, focus points directly translate into influence. So in South America, for example, we could spend 2 influence 
influence at the start of our focus because we get two focus points. Those two influence can strengthen our grip on South America decidedly. They do leave you, however, with fewer turns within the actual focus, except for the home theater, but more on that later. For the moment, let's just take a look at what focuses do. With every focus choice, you can also choose an interest that you want to get every turn that focus is active. So for example, you could choose elites or military for Western Europe arms race. The points are stored down there, we'll get to that in a second. For disarmaments, you always get cash and or popular support. Uh, sometimes disarmaments, for example here, have government and sometimes arms races also have government. So government can appear in either of the two, wh whereas the other two focuses that they have each are always exclusive to disarmament and arms race. You should decide on what you want to pick. For example, government is something that you do want to pick if you play with a lot of leaders. We will go into that in a second. When you make a focus choice, always make sure that you see how many turns, so focus points you actually get. Make sure that you know what resource you need and that is what you want to pick up. If it's the military, it's the military. If it is the elites, then you will pick up one elite per turn for every turn within that focus. Now let's move on to another interesting part of the UI. What you can see here in the blue numbers are our percentage strength within a theater and in the red numbers it is what the USSR have in terms of influence in a theater. What you can see to the right of that on some focuses is if there is a disarmament focus available this determines and tells us how much influence we would gain in that theater. 70 plus 16 makes 86. So we need four more percent to actually make it to the third dominance level, but if we do that, we would get one more victory point every single timeline. I hope that everything is clear so far. Let's move on to the interests and start with money. So money points essentially are our budget. How much can we actually spend? Are we in a good economic uh, position? Or are we in a recession and so on and so forth? You never want it maxed out or minimized out because that would mean that certain interest groups are either too weak or too strong that your economy could go bankrupt and you get ousted. That is the law background. Now let's talk about a practical effect. With money under state affairs, you can buy armed forces. Now, as you can see, you have multiple units that you can buy for the units and warfare. We will talk about that later. This second thing here is popular support. This describes what the populace thinks about you, both in your nation but also worldwide. If it is too low, they may oust you. If it is too high, there may be a populace rising up, taking your position and ousting you as well. Now what do you do with popular support? You get active in theatres that are not the primary theatre. For example, if the Middle East was the primary theatre, you would have to use popular points to be active in other side theatres. Moving on, let's talk about elites. Elites are your secret services. They are also influential families and politicians that might rebel against you. If it's too low, then obviously you're gonna get ousted by a cabal behind you. You mostly use it for intel operations to gain an edge on your opponent in theatres and so on and so forth. The next one upcoming here is the military. The military obviously being a very important faction within the Cold War makes it so that if you run out of it your military is overstretched and underfunded. The military might also then rise up against you, be it in an election or in uh, less proper means. The military points are mostly used for two things. Nuclear technology, and as you can see here, they are quite important. We will go into the details for nuclear technology later on, but if you don't research them, you will fall behind and a nuclear war would mostly devastate you instead of devastating both you and the enemy. Sometimes these techs only influence how fast you produce bombs, but other times you even get something like submarines suddenly being able to fire bombs. So watch out. The next thing you can do with military points is the space race. I mentioned this before, it can lead to victory, but most importantly it gives you victory points every time you achieve something first. So the first one here gets the victory points. This also obviously gets more expensive and the very last tech, as I mentioned, ends the game as it renders the nuclear capabilities of your enemy useless. So much for the military, let's move on to the government, always very important. It signifies what your administration is all about, if it is corrupt, if it is a bureaucratic hellhole or if it just works perfectly. It is also and mostly practically used to recruit leaders. Leaders are people that you can use all over the world in different theatres. For example, we have David Ben-Gurion here for this timeline. And you can use them to mark territory, to claim it, to have special abilities and so on and so forth. We will do an episode only on leaders. But as you can see, there's plenty of leaders to go around in different timelines. You will never, likely never recruit all leaders. Uh, but you can even recruit leaders in territory that you do not have under your control. For example, Imran Nagy is over here in Hungary. A troublemaker for the USSR is the if the other player does not watch out. Alright, so far so good, now let us move on to the actual focus selection. We first need to determine which interest we need the most. If it is elite, so if you want to get active in intel operations, then you most certainly should pick that. If you want to be active in side theatres, popular support is the way to go. 
I want to encourage you to always check what interests you need every single timeline because it will definitely determine your playstyle. If you want to play with leaders then you want to pick government and I believe that that is exactly what we are going to do here. I love government as a playstyle and I also love getting active in Eastern Europe as a starting position. Now let me point out one single thing. Every single time you play this game, you should consider all theatres worldwide, no matter where your influence is and so on and so forth, because the actual focuses that you get are randomised. Sometimes you don't get an arms race in Eastern Europe, sometimes you get an arms race in East Asia and it could be worth it if you're gunning for control of that theatre. What we're going to go with is arms race in Eastern Europe with government focus, so that we can recruit leaders and take care and isolate the USSR in their region. You can see that the Aleutian Islands are dominated by us and we will keep it that way. The arrows you can see on screen there indicate that we can move fleets and troops into the theater. That is what we want to do. What we see first here is that the USSR gets their focus to be done first. Uh, all right, let me just check the message log. Okay, there you go. Uh, the message log can be activated by clicking anywhere here at the bottom and it tells you, as long as you know, as, as long as you witnessed it, what the enemy did. In this case, we can tell that they influenced Afghanistan and the Indochinese zone. The range of influences in zones are from 5 to 5, so 5 hour point, then down to 0 is neutral, and then 5 of their points is in entirely their dominated zone. They are probably trying to gain access here to the Indian Ocean with their uh, disarmament. However, this is a disarmament, so they have only two focus points. Let's check that out in focus management. You can see your opponent's focus by the colouring. Uh, it gives us for two rounds government, but they can only act in this theatre as a prime theatre for two turns. Once each of us has taken two turns, we move on to the US focus. The US comes second here because in the first turn, the USSR always starts out first. And once our turn comes along, we can start being aggressive as it is an arms race. For the moment, let's have a look at this because it is quite interesting to see. They might be going for the Indian Ocean to have some fleets down there so that they can threaten us in Australia. We can't really put anything down there because it would be too costly, it costs multiple focus points. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to ignore the primary theater, which is marked in thick lines, and are going to move to a different non-primary theater. Now I'm going to select uh, East Asia just because we can. With this not being a primary theater, we need to use popular power if we want to do anything in it. You will see that here in a second. So we placed our troop over there and if we want to do anything with that troop, right now by the way it is the turn of the USSR, and if we want to do anything with that troop we will have to use people power. So that will take you know, some persuading of the populace to make it clear, hey, we really do have to be active there. And in the message log again, we saw that they are trying to do a false flag in Panama. And in Panama, quite an interesting thing, because that is a strait, that is a canal that they don't want to have fall in our hands. Now, if I select this troop and do something with it, don't worry what it is yet, we're going to focus on that in a different tutorial, it will cost us people power. That people power isn't endless. But what we can do with it, we can be active in different theaters, for example in this one, and in this one we can now establish control of Eastern China, which could be beneficial long term for our side. You always have to weigh out if it's worth it. Right now we're sitting at 32%, so it's not really worth it going up to 50 just for one victory point for, per timeline. I'm just doing it mostly to interfere with anything they could do in China. It's always a good strategy. So let's do it, and as you can see this territory now flipped to us since it went from 2 to 3. And here we are in our focus. Now our focus was in Eastern Europe and these arrows indicate that we can move troops and ships into the theater from other theaters. We know that they have a surface fleet in this. It's a bit of a rock paper scissors system. Surface fleets beat submarines, submarines beat carriers and carriers beat surface fleets. So my plan is to get rid of the surface fleet in there and sustain our control of the Aleutian Islands because it isolates the USSR. If we have that they have to go through the Mediterranean or the Indian Ocean to get their fleets into the high seas. This isolates them so much that we can contain them quite easily. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the carrier in as this is an arms race. Again, we can move troops into different theaters. This action pushed their surface fleet back into the eastern Siberian coast. And now we have everything that we need here in the east to contain the Soviet Union. We control the Aleutian Islands in the heart of the Soviet Union, in their home theater. And frankly, that is quite the good move against a militarily aggressive and expansive player because it contains them right here in the home theater of the Soviet Union. I would suggest you tr uh, try this move out and see if it works for you or if you can build up on it in any other way. This was the first video of the strategy guide for Terminal Conflict. I will be back with another video in time. I hope that you learned a lot, enjoyed this video, and if you have any questions, just leave a comment. I will see you 
in the next iteration of Terminal Conflict. Later.